Hello everyone, today is the day 5 of the 6th week of this lecture series. So, uh, let us uh, quickly recap whatever we learnt in last uh, class. So, we took an example of naphthalene uh, to illustrate uh, all the knowledges about uh, uh, SALC formation using the projection operator and uh, ultimately you know utilizing those SALCs to uh, uh, form the you know energy state of the molecule. So, essentially the molecular orbital of naphthalene molecule. So, uh, what we did, uh, let us uh, go through that quickly uh, before we uh, move on to our uh, next uh, lesson. So, uh, first we figured out the uh, point group of uh, the naphthalene which is D2H and uh, then we took uh, the 10 p pi orbitals sitting on 10 carbon atoms. So, using those 10 p pi orbitals, we formed an irreducible representation which is gamma. Okay. So, uh, we also said that uh, we can actually uh, you know separate this uh, p pi orbitals into three different sets because this uh, you know different carbon atoms uh, forms different sets of equivalent carbon atoms. So, we therefore, uh, made uh, uh, set 1, set 2, set 3 comprising 4, uh, 4 and 2 uh, p pi orbitals and uh, individually we form the representations of uh, uh, using the you know basis set 1, 2 and 3 and ultimately we reduce them and we got the <coughs> uh, irreducible representation to which uh, this uh, uh, we found the irreducible representation that occurred within the irreducible representations that we formed out of set 1, 2 and 3. And uh, we also uh, you know uh, said that uh, either way that is you uh, you know form the separate three representations and then ultimately reduce it to the irreducible representation or you uh, you know take all the you know p pi orbitals form at you know uh, uh, representation which is 10 dimensional and then reduce it the result will be ultimately same. So, after you uh, do that you uh, use the projection operator for each individual IRs that are uh, you know obtained and you find the SALCs. So, uh, we saw that there are certain number of uh, irreducible representation occurring uh, for example, like uh, you know AU uh, irreducible representation occurs uh, 2 times, B1U occurs 3 times, B3G occurs 3 times while B2G occurs 2 times. So, that means that I will have total 10 uh, molecular orbital which are you know, uh, you know given by this SALCs that we have formed and uh, these 10 SLCs will have their own energies. So, in the next step we are supposed to uh, find out these energies. So, how did we do that? Uh, we formed uh, you know uh, secular equations in terms of the secular determinants and here in this case uh, you know because we formed this you know uh, individual sets and from there we found that uh, essentially 4 individual irreducible representations are there and uh, correspondingly we had like uh, 2 or 3 number of SLCs uh, which transform uh, according to the particular irreducible representation that we uh, ultimately found. So, we get uh, you know uh, this secular determinant to be a you know block factored determinant and we took out each block and then form four individual secular equations in terms of four individual uh, you know this uh, blocks and solving that utilizing Huckel's approximation which says that uh, the you know interaction energy between two orbitals are 0 uh, until unless these two orbitals are uh, adjacent to each other ok. And uh, that uh, you know energy of this interaction is uh, expressed in terms of beta and beta uh, is the unit of energy here and uh, the interaction with itself that is phi i h uh, phi i this quantity is uh, written as alpha and alpha is taken to be the zero of energy according to Huckel's approximation and the interaction uh, the overlap integral that is uh, you know phi 1 phi 2 
uh, integration over all the space uh, is taken to be 0 under Huckel's approximation. So, utilizing that we could find out all the energies of the uh, you know 10 different SLCs that we can have. So, uh, ultimately we found the you know energies of the possible MOs to be like this. So, uh, two SLCs which uh, you know has the same symmetry AU has two different energies all right. Similarly, for B 1 U and B 2 G and B 3 G we found you know uh, a number of energy levels. Now, our job was to arrange these energy levels correct. So, uh, you know uh, beta is negative. So, therefore, the ordering of energy is done in such a way that is shown on your screen. So, uh, these are expressed in terms of beta and beta itself is negative. So, overall this energy here is negative and 0 as we mentioned corresponds to the energies of the atomic orbitals which are not interacting. That means, before the formation of the molecular the bonds uh, whatever the energies uh, the atoms have they are taken to be the 0 of energy and whenever there is an interaction favorable interaction we have uh, you know lowering of energy which is given here. So, these are expressed in terms of beta. So, beta is negative. So, overall these energies are all negative while this uh, uh, terms here that is minus 0.618 that is also expressed in terms of beta which is negative. So, overall this is a positive energy correct. So, uh, these are higher energy. In the next step we are supposed to uh, fill out this energy levels uh, using uh, with the electrons. So, there we utilize the you know Hund's uh, rule and the exclusion principle. So, uh, what does that say that uh, you know this you know in case of uh, the order of filling of uh, molecular orbitals for the ground state of a molecule uh, it, it follows the same rule as does the filling of atomic orbitals in the ground state of an atom. So, uh, the an electron will go into the lowest unfilled level subject to the subject to certain restriction. What are those restrictions? The only two electrons may occupy a single level and their spins must be opposite that is the exclusion principle right uh, Pauli's exclusion principle. Uh, when electrons are to be placed in a pair of degenerate orbitals suppose you have two orbitals having same energy we call them as a degenerate orbital. So, if you have to fill there, so you have to fill both of them having the same spin so that overall the total spin becomes 1 so, which is uh, uh, the Hund's rule right. So, using this uh, exclusion principle and the uh, Hund's rule we fill out this energy level. Now, uh, after getting this, uh, this overall uh, molecular orbital picture and their energies. Uh, Next, we will uh, talk about the you know uh, this interaction between different energy levels, meaning the you know transition from one electronic level to another electronic level, and the corresponding selection rules. So uh, we'll stop the discussion right here about uh, this you know uh, molecular orbitals and the corresponding electronic levels and their transitions involved between the electronic levels. Uh, we'll come back to this uh, after a while. So, uh, in the meantime what we will try to look at is to look at certain internal uh, motions of uh, the molecule the, the bonds and uh, specifically we will deal with the molecular vibrations the normal modes and uh, uh, we will try to see how uh, symmetry uh, properties of the molecule can be applied to molecular vibration to uh, you know find out the exact normal modes uh, their symmetries and their you know uh, you know many vibrational transitions or raman transitions their probabilities and the corresponding selection rules so this is what we are going to uh, you know uh, study for another uh, 5 or 6 lectures so, uh, to start with uh, you know if I take any given molecule they will have uh, 
three uh, different ways to store their internal energy. So, one is translation, uh, you know, rotation, vibration. So, uh, if if I have a molecule having certain you know atoms and then certain bonds there, so this bonds can uh, move in any particular direction or by changing an angle with respect to another bond in such a way that there this motion will not uh, displace uh, the molecule in a particular direction. That means, it will not uh, lead to any translation motion that is there will be no movement of the center of mass of the molecule. And also this uh, type of motion that I am talking about uh, that uh, you know may not change the uh, net angular momentum of this molecule meaning that there will be no rotation and such motions of the you know bonds in a molecule is known as the vibration. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> uh, if, if, I, if I take uh, uh, you know uh, any particular uh, uh, molecule and consider the internal motions of this uh, uh, bonds or atoms, uh, we, we, we can see that uh, you know uh, there are bonds are moving in different directions or you know changing the angles. So, like for example, if I take just water molecule, so I can see this you know OH bonds can move in different way okay, or you know it can change its angles. Apparently, it may seem uh, that all these motions are very much random, but if you take a close look at that, observe it, you will see that nothing is random, but they are well, uh, you know, this motion is very much regular. The moment I say uh, some motion is regular, that means that there must be some symmetry into it, right? Because in the very first class, if you remember, we said like, uh, you know, what are the meaning of this word symmetry? One of these things is there must be some regularity in whatever the phenomena or, uh, you know, uh, in a process or in structure. So, uh, Sometime it may be that uh, you know this uh, you know regular uh, you know uh, regularity in this motion can be a bit time taking so that you know apparently it may seem like that there is no regularity but actually there it is and uh, you know uh, how do we classify this you know particular vibration because there may be several bonds several bonds are moving you know uh, executing vibration and all of these can be super in, uh, is actually superimposed and then we get an overall uh, you know uh, internal motion of this uh, bonds in a molecule and these are uh, actually uh, quantized by the so called normal modes okay so uh, many of us are familiar with terms like you know for a given molecule that there is a uh, stretching or there is a bending, there is you know symmetric stretching or asymmetric stretching or you know uh, in plane bending, out of plane bending. So, these are all actually the individual normal modes and uh, we will be dealing with these normal modes uh, to uh, find out about the molecular vibrations and their you know uh, associated uh, properties of this molecular vibration. Now, first and foremost thing is that how do we uh, find out what is the number of normal mode in a given molecule and probably many of you already know the answer okay? because many times you get a you know, simple formula and then you uh, just uh, use that formula and get the number of normal mode that is, a po that is possible, but many occasions you do that without actually knowing the uh, reason uh, behind this formula. So, if you if you take any any given molecule, uh, say for example, I will I will take a, a very simple example. Uh, say I have uh, uh, ammonia. Okay, so uh, 
so you know, each of this bond can you know execute certain motion okay such that this doesn't you know lead to any translation or rotation now uh, what i can uh, think of that for each and every atom will have their coordinates correct so x y and z this is true for each and every atom on the molecule now each coordinate is independent of the other coordinates so therefore this n can move in the x direction by certain amount without worrying about what is going to happen in y and z direction and h also can do the same thing and the, he can, it can do it in any direction it can do it in the z direction or in a y direction or in x direction which are all independent now suppose a situation when all the atoms uh, starts moving in x direction by a definite amount fine so what happens in that case you are moving the center of mass in x direction by that definite amount meaning the whole molecule is translating in x direction by a definite amount so i can do the same thing in y direction as well as in z direction so each of this directional motion will give me one translational degree of freedom so in x and y and z direction i get translational motion right so this three directional uh, three individually uh, uh, you know uh, individual direction of motion will give you total three translational degrees of freedom now if i think about uh, you know motion of this uh, you know uh, you know uh, atoms in a in angular path about either x or y or z axis now if all the atoms start you know executing this angular motion about one particular axis say x axis then that will amount to the rotation of the whole molecule by a definite amount right so it can be uh, about x axis and separately it can be about y axis and z axis so this three different uh, you know angular motions about three different axes are three rotations so i have three rotational degrees of freedom now overall how many i have so i said that the each and every atom can execute certain motion in either x or y or z direction okay or all together it can do and all three motions will be independent of each other therefore if i have n number of atoms so total number of motion uh, directional motions that can be executed by this uh, whole molecule will be uh, 3n right 3n is the total number of motion possible that is total number of degrees of freedom that it can execute so therefore i have three translation and three rotational so the rest should be the vibration so i have total 3n minus 6 number of degrees of freedom left for the molecule to execute vibrational motion so that's how we get this number 3n minus 6 now this is in general for any uh, molecule but when we consider a linear molecule so for example suppose i have uh, uh, the case of carbon dioxide this is a linear molecule so here each and every molecule can execute translation in x or y and z direction so the molecule can have three translation motion like this when i talk about the rotation then it can have you know <coughs> about this axis it can have a perpendicular axis to this but there is no meaning of having a rotation about this axis because all the nuclei are contained by this axis okay so i have essentially 
two rotational motions. So, instead of three here, I have two for linear molecule. So, therefore, for linear molecule, we have 3 n minus 5 okay, for linear. All right. So, uh, let us take some uh, you know definite example. So, uh, this th suppose I have a nonlinear molecule and I have 3 n minus 6 number of uh, you know vibrational degrees of freedom. So, each of these vibrational degrees of freedom is expressed by the uh, you know normal vibration or you know normal modes. So, we will take an example of uh, uh, a planar mole uh, molecule that is uh, carbonate ion. So, we will be talking about CO3 2 minus. Okay. So, if I represent this uh, uh, you know carbon and oxygen by this uh, circles, then I can take this to be my carbonate ion. Okay. So, the central part is the carbon and then three oxygens are there. So, uh, I will have total how many? There are 4 atoms, so 4 into 3, 12 minus 6. So, I will have 6 number of degrees of freedom. So, let us see how this normal mode actually look like. So, so I will first have 6 structures of uh, carbonate ion and then we will look at their uh, normal modes. Okay. So, take that all the bonds are actually identical. Okay. So, uh, so I have got total 6 number of uh, structure to show Six vibrational uh, normal modes. Okay, so say first mode is uh, I will use a different color uh, to exemplify this. So is this color visible? Okay. So this arrows okay so one two three arrows they uh, say signify the direction of the movement of the atom right so uh, also the you know the length that we uh, you know provide to this arrows they signifies the amount of the movement though it is quite a bit of exaggerated okay now uh, let us draw all the other uh, modes then it will be a uh, lot more clear. So, here uh, okay. so these are given as sign. So, plus and minus. I will explain what this sign means. Okay. And uh, So, we need to understand uh, the exact meaning of these arrows, their lengths, their uh, you know uh, from where they are originating and all these things in order to understand these motions properly. And then the last one, uh, 
Okay. And we will also give this motion because these are some vibrations, so they will have their associated frequencies. So, we will have mu 1 and maybe we will call uh, write it here, this is mu 1, this is mu 2, this is mu 3 and we will call this mu 3 a. There is a reason for doing that, we will talk about that and this is as mu 3 b and then we have mu 4 a and mu 4 b. All right. So, now here we have mostly uh, this motion showed by arrow and in one case it is shown by uh, the plus and minus signs. So, now you can see that uh, in many, many of this uh, normal mode picture, the arrows are having different lengths. So, what does that mean? Suppose here you have a longer arrow compared to the arrow which is sitting on this central carbon. This meaning that this atom over here, this oxygen is moving in this direction without worrying about what is happening to the rest of the molecule while this carbon is also moving in this direction, but the amount of movement in that particular direction by this atom and this atom are not equal and the you know the length the ratio of this length is actually the ratio of the amount of movement that two individual atoms are make, making in a particular direction. Okay. Now, as I said this lengths are quite exaggeration because this atoms do not really move this much which are comparable up, uh, to the bond length. Okay. So, this is just to uh, make things a uh, bit prominent to you and here this plus and minus sign this mean that you know this particular atom it is coming up above the plane of the board while this is, this oxygen is coming above the uh, board and this carbon atom is having the minus sign means that it is moving down the board. So, this is an out of plane motion while all these things all these other structures that new uh, barring new two all the other motions are in plane that is this molecule is a planner and all the you know motions of these atoms are within the plane. So, these are in plane vibrational motion while this is out of plane all right. Now, one thing you should notice that you know many cases we have uh, you know uh, uh, a misconception about how to draw this normal mode. So, here you if you look at carefully the arrow starts from an atom okay, and goes to an, an a particular direction. So, this particular thing means that this atom is moving in many cases you know you will find that people uh, write uh, uh, motion in a way like uh, they, they, they write like this okay, or this or this. This is completely a wrong way of representation. So, when you want to present the normal mode you exactly have to do it in this way that you start on that particular atom and then put the arrow in the direction which into which it is executing the motion all right and you have to take care of the relative length of the arrows you know uh, within a particular normal mode fine right? say so for example if you look at this one or this one this is very clear or this one right so that will tell you that by which amount one particular atom is moving in a particular direction relative to other atoms within the molecule so now uh, now here uh, Looking at this, I can have uh, two very important properties of these normal modes. Okay. So, these are the normal modes, these are possible. Now, right now I am just drawing this on the board, but you know how can I get this one? Suppose I draw some arbitrary uh, you know motions with arbitrary arrow direction, will I be able to tell that okay, this is the right normal mode or not? So, that must have certain rules okay. and these uh, you know uh, rules are governed by the symmetry and group theory and 
in the you know, following lessons, we will learn how to actually use group theory to find out the Excel exact normal modes, right? Now, uh, before ending today's lecture, I will mention two important properties of these normal modes. One is that uh, you know each of the vectors. So all these arrows that we are you, you know using, I said that they have a definite you know length and they have of course the direction. So they are the vectors. Okay, vectors of motion. So each of these vectors representing uh, this instantaneous movement of these atoms and uh, they are uh, you know uh, giving their displacement they may be regarded as the resultant of three basis vectors. So, we can consider each of this atom having their own uh, Cartesian coordinates x1, y1 and z1 and then we can think of this movement in a particular direction by a particular amount to be the resultant of these three basis vectors. right? And second thing is that which is extremely important to us that each of this normal mode they form a basis for uh, an irreducible representation of the molecular uh, point group. They may form the basis by themselves or they may actually uh, belong to one of these uh, IRs of the molecules. So, therefore, the structure that I drew, they will be assigned to particular irreducible representation. So, just for your information, if I put, so this one will form a representation of A1. Uh, this one will form the representation uh, of A2, while the new 3A will form the representation E prime, 3B will form the representation of again E prime, while new 4 will also form the representation for E prime. So, we will do the normal mode new 4 B. So, uh, these are the two main points about the normal modes that is their motions can be expressed by the resultant of three basis vector and second that each of these normal modes can you know uh, form the basis or not only can but they form the basis for the irreducible representation of the molecule uh, molecular point group. Okay. So, we will utilize these ideas and then we build on uh, uh, our uh, uh, you know uh, knowledge about this molecular vibration, their relation with the symmetry and uh, ultimately having the applications. Okay. So, uh, we will uh, come with those things in the following week and until then have a good day. Thank you very much for your attention.